Hey, well, kia ora. Good afternoon, everybody. Can I just say to all of you in the media, thank you so much for coming down to Christchurch and spending some time with us at our conference. Uh, it's been a fantastic weekend. Uh, we've got a very energised and very positive uh, members and volunteers and supporters, and it's been great to be here in Christchurch. We've obviously got a new president of the National Party in Sylvia Wood, which we're excited about as well. Uh, and I think the party, as you can probably sense, is in really good heart. Um, you would have seen in my speech today, I also announced a policy called Welfare That Works. And what that's really about is saying, look, we've got a problem in this country. We've got a lot of young people who are on a job seeker benefit under the age of 25. We've got a lot of them that actually have been on there for longer than a year. And it's just not good enough to leave them there. But we've also got a situation where we have low levels of unemployment and record levels of job vacancies in many sectors and in all regions of the country. And so if we can't move people from welfare to work now, when will we do that? And ultimately, um, is that that's, something's not working when we've got that situation. We've got, in, we've got lots of job vacancies, all sectors, all regions, and yet we've got more people on a job seeker, young people on a job seeker benefit for a long time. And we care deeply about that. We feel that Labor has abandoned those young people. We care deeply about them. Uh, we care deeply about young people because we want them to realise their potential. And we know uh, and the data tells us very clearly that when young people stay on a benefit for a long time, you know, their options and their opportunities are limited. And so that's the motivation for why we actually want to introduce this policy. Under Welfare That Works, there's three components, really, or three messages. The first is, if you're a young person and, if you want to, you know, and you're trying to find work, I want you to know that there is support coming. We want to be able to have a dedicated jobs coach, a really good assessment of what the barriers are for you to get to work, and then a really individualised job plan. And we're here to help connect you to work. Uh, and that's really important. But secondarily, if you're a young person and you don't want to work, I'm sorry, there are consequences for that, and there'll be sanctions around that as well. And as soon as you want to sign up and get on the plan, uh, that's great, but we're here to get you to work. Because in the National Party, we believe in rights and responsibilities, and it is your responsibility to take the opportunities that have been given to you to actually get yourself into work. And I guess the third message I'd say very clearly is to taxpayers, which is that where we see failure, we're not going to fund failure. And as a consequence, we're going to redirect money from the Ministry of Social Development into community providers. We think that there are, very, there are amazing community providers up and down this country who care deeply about young people, who also know where those jobs are and can connect them as a result. But that's our, we're, we are focused on outcomes in the National Party. And the outcomes matter in this country, because outcomes is actually what ends up changing people's daily lives. So that's the, that's the, 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 the three sort of broad components. I just want to say and acknowledge Louise Upston, who has been really awesome uh, leading our front bench through the development of this policy and uh, has built up the policy and series of discussions with us as a team over, over recent weeks and months. So with that, happy to take any of your questions. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Well, there has to be real rights and responsibilities and real consequences. So if you're a young person and you're, you can work and you're choosing not to work, that is unacceptable under a national government uh, because you're going to get the help whether you want it or not. And so there are sanctions. There's a sanctions regime that's available to us that we can apply uh, and we will apply. Uh, and there's also, you know, manage money and other things that we could extend to. I'll let Lou. Yeah, so the sanctions regime uh, that exists at the moment is a combination of reducing your benefit right through to suspension or cancellation. Uh, we also would introduce things like money management, mm. um, which is a non-financial sanction, but it is a consequence of a young person not playing their part. So is that similar to what Paul Bennett talked about in terms of using the card and that sort of thing? You're looking at that, what have they done in yeah, so the payment card you'll be familiar with applies currently for those under 20. Uh, we would use this in some cases as a sanction for those 18 to 24 that are not playing their part. Uh, and it's part of recognising this is an individualised solution to support young people to get them into work when there are masses of opportunities and employers mm. everywhere are desperate to employ them. And should they choose to get back on the program and re-engage, uh, we're good with that. You know. Have you, um, Sorry, I'll go. Yes, Jane. That you think might be, I mean, you know, there are obvious ones you know, that you might contract out to. Have you talked to them? What's their response? And, yep. you know, aren't they pretty full up already um, just dealing with their own business at the moment? Yeah, so I, I'm talking to community providers um, all the time. Actually, the feedback I get mm. uh, is that they're getting uh, great outcomes with some of the young people. Um, they want more of them. Mm. They have potential. They have capacity. 
And what's more important is that they've got employers they are working with that are desperate for staff, and so they want the young people that they can provide support to to make the connection and get them into work. And, be and because... Oh. Absolutely. So an example in my electorate, for example, is Topol Pathways. Uh, and they started with an employer focus, trying to support employ employers to find young people into jobs. Uh, Organisations like mm. both of us have visited, Monarchy, Mon uh, Tairawhiti, um, Vision West that we're uh, meeting with I tomorrow. Mm. Um, there's lots of organisations that have capacity that do great work. We want them to do more of it. And I think that's one of the things I've observed is that every week I go to two or three towns and when I visit I always make time for community organisations, either in a group or several one-on-one. -on -one. And what I'm amazed at is there are awesome community organisations but they need to be scaled up, powered up uh, and they can deliver great outcomes and great results. And so why wouldn't we invest more uh, in, in empowering and powering up our community organisations rather than continuing to fund MSD uh, for non-delivery and, and failure? There's also the character No, look, I mean, as, as we know, the longer someone's on a benefit, the harder it is to get off. And so there's actually a really um, a range of complex cases. You know, if you think about someone who's come on to a job seeker benefit, and we just feel like after three months we've got to be starting to make some interventions, and that's why it captures someone who's been on for longer than three months. But obviously someone three months or six months is different from someone that's been on four or five years. And so there's different levels of complexity or barriers that we have to deal with. Um, and so we think it's an, an incentive for a young person who's been on longer than a year, who's likely to stay on welfare for longer. And just, and just remember, this is the critical fact. If you're on welfare at 20, over your lifetime you're going to be on welfare for over 12 years. And so that's, that's just not a good outcome for that person in their life. But also the, the, the social costs associated with that with respect to children raised in benefit homes, the outcomes are, are, are worse. You know, we want to be able to get to a place where we, actually, you know, we can actually support those people. And with this policy, will it also apply to the young people on job seeker benefits who have got disabilities in yeah. sicknesses, or, or are they going to be... I'll let Lou talk to that. Yeah, so, so those who are on a job seeker benefit, whether they are classified as work ready or they are classified with a health condition, if they're a health condition, the expectation is that they will be able to be in work uh, within a two-year period. So actually for that group, this policy will work really, really well because it's individualised support, mm. uh, an, a needs assessment for that individual with a plan and a job coach that supports them. So some of them might be able to work part-time mm. and that part-time work is their pathway to into employment. employment. So we're actually not willing to just have them and leave them there without what they need and the support they need to be into employment. So let me give you an example. I'll give you an example of a young man that I met three weeks ago. He's never had a job. He, has, he suffers from depression and anxiety uh, and he is finally working part-time and it's actually working part-time, going to work regularly, that is building his confidence and is growing his mental health. So we want to support people like that uh, to give them a chance at part-time work and a pathway off welfare into work. Sam, can I come to you? Sorry. How much money would you be taking out of MSD to fund this, and what yep. would that mean in terms of redundancy? Presumably you'd have to let people of the ministry go. Yeah, so if you look at the total um, cost of this over the four-year period, it's less than 1% of the That's social true. development vote it's that is uh, non-benefit, right? So it's 1%. So it's and we would expect that over time we wouldn't fill new vacancies that appeared in MSD. We want to move the funding to community providers to get the outcomes where there are masses of jobs available, mm. sectors, whether it's dairy, construction, horticulture, retail, tourism and hospitality, that have jobs available. We want to use this opportunity, which is a golden time, mm. to connect young people so to those jobs. Sorry, terms, sorry, come Sam. So it's 46 million, uh, which is, as I said, less than one percent, uh, and we would expect that over time that we wouldn't be filling vacancies that exist in MSD. And there there'll be a, a number of vacancies there already, right, in terms of attrition that's occurred and, and vacancies that are there. Sorry, I'll come to Aaron and then Amelia. Would you rule out making anyone redundant per se, as in the vacancies open up and then, and then you kind of just don't refill them? But 
We are obsessed on getting outcomes. That's the thing that we have forgotten to do in this country. And so whatever it takes to get an outcome, we're going to do it. And if that means we're going to be powering down MSD resources and budgets and redirecting that very strongly into community organisations, we'll do that. So you wouldn't let people go? May well have to be the case. So, so where Two someone's categories. got uh, a health condition um, or a disability, which means they um, will be able to work within the two-year period, yes, they'll have a job coach if they're with a community organisation. They'll have an individual needs assessment and they will create a plan based on what they are able to do. So for some who have you know, very severe mental health issues, um, actually, it might be unrealistic that they are working within an 18-month period, but there will be things that are part of their plan. To get regularly, them on a pathway. Yeah, regularly attending uh, counselling sessions. Uh, it, it might be that they need to do, um, or that there's the option, option of doing some volunteer work, for example. It will be a plan that suits their needs and supports them on that pathway mm. into work. And what about Yeah, so the intention of this policy is, so I want to be clear, it's not aimed at those on the sole parent benefit. Uh, this is aimed at those who are on job seeker. Um, and so the sanctions would apply. And that's one of the reasons also we'd look at non financial penalties or obligations like money management. And just Yeah, well, it's exactly, it is social investment. We're saying we want outcomes and improved outcomes for people, and we're, we are going to work with community providers, which is one of the, you know, we, don't, we don't believe centralisation and control and running everything through Wellington is the best answer through government. We think community providers actually see the pain, the hurt, the frustration, the need, are best place to be able to deliver those services. And that's why, that's what, we want outcomes, and that's what social investment is all about, deliver outcomes and, 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 and make sure that the money is being well spent in doing so. Can I go to, um, um, yeah, sorry, um, 30, so Luke. So said that there are 34,000 Correct. Sorry, say that again. Oh, I'm not sure. All I can tell you is. Yeah, I mean, I guess the key issue is, you know, there's 34,000 young people on job seeker benefit. There's 27,000 that have been on longer than three months. There's 13,000 that have been longer than a year, and that's really the. You know, the, 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 and what we're saying is, after three months, we can't wait 12 months to make an intervention. We need to do it much quicker, much smarter, and particularly at a time when we've got massive job shortages and there's huge employment opportunities. It's a, it's a part of our economic cycle we haven't experienced before, and we should be, we should be leveraging it and doing everything we can. Have you, um, uh, have you spoken to any potential community providers who might be, might be aligned to, to run Yes, we have. Those? Yes, we have. Um, well, we talked about the ones we talked about before. I've met with Manaki Tarafati, which is an outstanding organisation. Uh, I've also gone and visited with Vision West um, in recent months as well. Um, and Lou talked about a local topo one as well. But I can tell you, up and down this country, you know, there are amazing, amazing organisations that actually would want to extend into the space. And on the other side of the equation, employers who are so desperately wait, you know, crying out for workers, uh, we've got huge support from that as well. Uh, sorry, sir. Yeah, so it was great that we have a remit process where grassroots members put policies up, um, and we'll take that seriously. Mm. Well, we have to we have to evaluate it, and uh, we've got a wide range of options on the table. Um, but it was supported by our members. Yes. What I'm telling you right now is, we listen to our members. We'll take that remit in and give it consideration. Yeah, so we, we think um, because we want um, these young people to actually get the support they need, we're sort of looking at a one coach to 20 young people. Uh, and as you could imagine, um, you're working more intensively at the start and, and phasing it over time. 
Um, but we want to make sure these young people are supported, that we address the barriers to work they have to support them off welfare into and, work. And would the council, would the coach, sorry, stay in touch with the worker? Correct. That, that, that's the whole idea, because you've identified the right problem, which is that so many times we get young people to start a job for a couple of days or even a couple of weeks, and then they fail or they don't show. And what we're really wanting to do is make sure that that community organisation, that jobs coach, has prepared them well so they'll work ready, but importantly actually sticks with them and some of the challenges that they'll encounter over the next 12 months. Because we believe if we can keep them in a job for 12 consecutive months, we're actually breaking the pattern of welfare dependency as a result. Uh, to, to those young people, yes. Can you just clarify the comment you made about the um, non-financial penalty in terms of the use of the car? It is just for the job seeker, it's not for people on sole benefit? It is definitely not for, it is definitely not no, for just, those on sole parent benefit. Okay. This is a policy at job seekers, those 18 to 25. Uh, this is a policy we've been discussing for months, actually, and so we have a process, as I've talked to you about before, around policy development in our, in our caucus, and uh, we have a front bench team, and we, we, we brought this policy through several months ago, and we just go through a series of iterations and actually get everyone involved in it and thinking about it, uh, and that's what we've come to today. Some of the members have talked about it being kind of tough love. Would you agree with that, uh, that description? Well, it might well be a good description of it, uh, but the reality is we need to get better and different outcomes in this country. And so, yes, uh, we're going to back young people who want to work and make sure that we can help them get through the challenges that they encounter. But equally, for those that don't want to work, I'm sorry, there are consequences. Uh, there are consequences to life, and there will be sanctions. So, Richard. Uh, um, on the conference more generally, you, President, your first conference as leader, how's a different conference last year? Um, well, I haven't been to that many conferences, as you're aware, but, um, but it was. But I mean, I just think the energy's in really great shape, and it's what I see up and down the country. We've had good growth in membership, we've had good growth in supporters and donors, as you've seen, uh, and I think you've got a sense that people are feeling positive and energised, they want to change the government, uh, and, it's, and I think we're in a really positive, renewed sense and, and refreshed sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we, I, I told you from the beginning, you know, we went through a period of dysfunction. I said we'd turn the page. I said we'd reset. I said we'd leave the baggage behind. And I hope you've started to see that in the parliamentary caucus, but also in the party organisation here as well. And so, you know, I'm really excited about Sylvia Wood as our new president of the party. I think she's going to bring a, a lot to the role. She's been a tireless worker for the party for a long period of time. She's got huge respect amongst our members and amongst our board. Uh, and it was a, you know, it was a, it was a really great, uh, there's a really good board dynamic there and she's going to lead us incredibly well. Being a more conservative party, is it hard to get the party faithful up and going? No, no, look, I mean, you've got to understand, you know, we, you know, on our side, we think the country's going the wrong direction, and it is. I mean, you just literally can pick the economy, health, education, housing, crime, and we're getting worse outcomes, not better outcomes. And so, you know, across this whole country, um, as part of the party, but people outside the party as well, uh, there's a real desire for change. You know, people think the country's heading in the wrong direction, and it is. And that's what this has been about this weekend. Do you think President Xi is an authoritarian? Sorry? Do you think President Xi is an authoritarian? I'm not going to go there today. We're talking about conference. Uh, look, I think, as you know, in our foreign policy, we've got really clear foreign policy. We have an independent foreign policy. We respect the nation states. We respect the rule of law. Uh, we're a trading nation, and those are the values that we'll stand up for. When it comes to young people on JobSeeker, Carmel Cipollone, she's say, in the last 12 months, 35,000 young people left JobSeeker and found her. She says they're getting results. Well, they're not getting results, right, because we've seen it. We've had almost a doubling of young people under the age of 25 on a job seeker benefit for more than a year. So the outcomes are not being achieved. And that's why we're saying we're not there to fund failure and we'll actually engage and use community providers because we think they can deliver better the outcomes that we need to secure. And you said, you said you've been working on this policy for months, but just two days ago you didn't seem to understand around a third of young people are job seeker benefits. Are they because they've got health or disability issues? No, I understand that well. I understand that well. What we've said to you is... And you don't. You said they get, they get, they're entitled to other benefits, not job seeker. Well, no, no, but the, what I'm saying to you, within the job seeker frame, we have work-ready people, we have health and disability, uh, and we, but we want to put everybody on a pathway to work. It's really important. Isn't it just ingenious, though, to think about those numbers without making that breakdown, without actually making the point that not everyone on that job seeker benefit is going to get the same benefit that everyone else? Definitely not. 
or, you know, the job seeker category, whether this we talked about it work. in 2017. The categories haven't changed. The categories haven't changed. The way we've counted it hasn't changed. There's 50,000. No, no, there's 50,000 more than there were in 2017. And then when we talk about young people, it is nearly doubled for those that have been on the job seeker benefit for a mm. year or more. But we are focused on the job seekers, mm. whether they are work ready or whether they have health conditions. And we will not give up mm. on a young person who has a health condition and mm. a disability. We want to support them just as much as anyone else to break that cycle and to give them the support, the one-on-one, -on -one individualised mm. assistance they need. Which is great in terms of the, the carrot, but when it comes to the stick, is there going to be any discretion, I suppose, coming back to a meeting's question, because these people are, yes, they're in the same category, but they're not in the same circumstances. So what discretion do you give to somebody be appropriate really struggling with something? Mm. And actually they can't work in their, you know, in their, in their belief, or, or they can't. So, you yeah. to... so I want to be clear that the young person will have an individual needs assessment with an individual plan for them that is agreed with their job coach. So for some, their plan will look quite different from others and their obligations will be to their plan. Mm. It is individual. It is not this one size fits all. Mm. And we recognise that some young people have far more complex challenges to overcome, but actually, mm. we believe in them. Mm. We believe that with the right support, targeted, individualised, that we can support them and mm. we can break that cycle of welfare dependency. Well, in theory, you know, that's a, you know, the principle of attention, of course, is great, but isn't there a risk that you get into an individual job plan and there actually isn't a, um, you know, they don't come together in terms of what the job coach or MSD thinks? Um, and the young person things, which could make it worse for them. I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking about a situation where um, someone's told you can work, they actually can't or can't believe, and, and that's not going to necessarily be a good thing for them, especially if they say losing financial support. It's their plan. It's their plan. The young person, the young person with their job coach, right? That that is the difference at the moment. Uh, the government takes a very hands-off approach to these young people, and we're unwilling to do that. I suppose, you know, people in the welfare system, as you know, as you know Absolutely. don't feel like they always have a lot of control. So when you say, oh, it'll be up to you, you know, you'll have that input. I mean, you know, can people really trust that when it actually comes to that situation, the young person will have the, enough input to say, I don't think I can work for blah, 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 as opposed to being told what to do under mm -hmm. that particular regime? Mm -hmm. And that is, the, that is the individual support. And I'm not for a moment, having been there myself, I am not for a moment suggesting it is not incredibly difficult. Mm. And we want to make sure that those young Kiwis get the support they need and they have agency over the decisions, their plan and their support. Aaron, can... And following off on that, what, what thought has been given to who these job coaches are and what the process would be in terms of recruiting to make sure that you have people that are A, connected to the community, that, that are best suited for different people? That'll be a decision for those community organisations and those providers. But I can tell you now, there are amazing organisations getting alongside young people up and down this country that actually want to be scaled up, that want to be empowered and powered up to actually do more of the work uh, and, and, do, and do a greater volume of it. And those are the organisations. And we're going to continue to invest in them and we're going to flow more and more funding to those organisations if they deliver results. That's what we're, that's what we're really focusing on here. We want to secure results. One word to describe the weekend. Oh, exciting and energising, you know. And, and there's two words. I know I can give you a lot more, <laughs> but positive. And um, and I think you've got a sense. You know, we've renewed, we're refreshed, we're positive, we're energised, and we're ready to go. So I'm um, yeah, looking. Words. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty pumped. <laughs> What's that? Uh, uh, well, I think, I think well, it's a bit of a rebrand for us that we've wanted to, to we've, we've, we've launched this weekend, which is fantastic. So um, it just means that as, as, a, as a, a male MP, I can now wear not just a navy tie, I can actually wear some sort of purple tie, which would be good. Hey, listen, with that, can I say thanks so much for your questions? Um, and uh, we've got a plane to catch, but we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks so much. See ya. Thanks.